everybody. Today we're going to talk about a very important uh, subject. Uh, filter banks, time frequency, joint time frequency analysis of the signal. Gabor, transform, short time Fourier transform and finally the wavelets and multi-resolution analysis. So, what we had so far was about the transformation of the signal in the time domain, normally in the time domain, into the frequency domain, and to get the information of the frequency components which are contained inside the, the signal. <coughs> So, it, it turns out that there are a lot of applications that just, just getting the information of the signal itself would not be sufficient. One of these applications is called the subband coding. So, whatever I try to point out in this lecture is actually <coughs> used frequently in different types of applications like compressing of the signal, the compression of the signal, in subband coding, which I'll explain it later, in sparse representation of the signal. When I say sparse, I mean that using, you know, as, as fewer components of the signal, as fewer supports for the signal that would represent the signal as possible. So, there are a lot of applications, and I will start with subband coding. It's very important. We know that if we transform any time domain signal into the frequency domain, it will, for example, using the DFT or uh, continuous time Fourier transform, we will get the frequency components or the frequency information of the signal over the entire bandwidth that the signal is taking. So assuming that in the digital domain, the minimum frequency starts from zero, omega zero, and the high frequency ends at omega pi, then at this signal, assuming that the signal is band limited, so it just occupies a part of this bandwidth, then it will start from some starting point in this bandwidth and ends somewhere. And hopefully it's band, if it's band limited, it will not take the entire spectrum. Otherwise, because of the repetition, uh, inherence in the digital Fourier transform, the DFT or FFT, these repetitions will make aliasing. So, in subband coding, what we try to convey as a message is that for every signal, there is always part of the bandwidth. If you can chop the bandwidth into the smaller divisions. It's always the problem that some of these slices are not as important as the others. So, the part of the information which is contained in some of these slices is much more important than the others. So, if you can somehow concentrate on those slices and get more information from those parts, and then we can just relax our concentration over the other slices and try to code this information. It means that the signal, even though the information over these slices are not uniformly distributed, but the general, the, the total information which is transferred by this kind of by this kind of strategy is much much more than the standard Fourier transform. Subband coding 
For example, it started, it started for the speech uh, signal. It started with this idea that there are some, po for example, for the, for, for the music or for the speech case, the most important part of the spectrum is from uh, something like 20 hertz, for example, up to 8 kilohertz maximum. So it means that any frequency size over the 8 kilohertz is not as important as this part of the spectrum. So, and even, even for this spectrum from 20 hertz to 8 kilohertz, the portion of the information which contained, which is contained in, for example, something like uh, 500 hertz up to 200, 2000, for example, 200 or 300 is much more important than the rest of the spectrum. Why? Because inherently this part of the spectrum for the speech signal contains a lot of features. Which are, these, these features are unique for every person. So if the goal of communicating this information as a speech information is to understand who is talking and what's exactly uttered, if we know that this part of the spectrum completely, if the information for this part of the spectrum is already provided accurately, we would be able, possibly, we would be able to recover the data without any error. So the beach frequency, which is unique for every person, starts from around 100 hertz up to, for example, 300, 400 or for the children, around 500, for example, or 800. And the format frequencies, which are the vocal, vocal tract modes, actually, they are up to the third format is up to 2,200 or 300 in maximum case for different, uh, for different examples. So if we have the pitch frequency and the format frequencies, almost we can get the, the important portion of the features that we need for the speech signal to be recovered or to be coded. So in subband coding, the idea is to chop the spectrum of the signal into different slices. And then we do the filtering for every part, for every slice. And we do the quantization, so we try to allocate bits for every part of those uh, spectrum slices. So, assuming that we, ha we have eight bits um, resolution for every, every spectrum, every part of the spectrum. So, it means that for it, it, we can actually assign, uh, for example, eight bits for the first part of the spectrum, 8 bits for the second, but for example for uh, more than 3,000 hertz or 3 kilohertz, we don't need actually to get, to have 8 bits of resolution. We can just use 2 bits of resolution, or 3 bits of resolution. And for the higher part of the spectrum, we can just assign 1 bit. That's just the noise. We're not important information. So, that means somehow non-uniformly distributing the, uh, or encoding different slices of the spectrum. The tools in ESP which gives you this possibility to implement such kind of idea is called filter bank. So in filter bank, essentially you have a signal in the out in the input, which is called for example X of N. Then you try to chop down the spectrum of the signal to different bands. For example, from the zero which belongs to the base band of the signal, starting from the DC to the, the low pass filter actually. And then several other band pass filters. And finally, for example, it should be here, uh, high pass filter.
Then you do, do your processing, whatever processing you need. It can be denoising, debrayering, de reverberation, whatever. At the moment, we don't care about this kind of processing, which is going to be held here in the middle. But the final stage would be to recover the information. So it means that whatever we did in the analysis part, we have to do a counter in the synthesis part. So we need again filters, which are called the synthesis filters. Normally they are denoted by G. And the same G0, T, G, and minus one. So M channels, M analysis filters, and M synthesis filters. Combining all the information together, we have to get Y of M. So, in an ideal case, it would look like this. You have the spectrum of the signal from 0 to 2 pi, or from minus pi to pi. For the real signals, it doesn't matter actually. And then in an ideal case, it means that you're chopping, for example, the 2 pi spectrum into m divisions. Into m divisions with the bandwidth of each division or each size, which is 2 pi over m. In an ideal case, this filter will look like this. So there's no bar pattern. You're showing that the adjacent filters, they just, they are connected. We know that it's not possible. And any of these filters, they have the color frequency which is 2 pi over n. And for the k filter, you have 2 pi over n times k. K can start from 0. Well, 0, we don't need it actually. So it starts from 1 to n. It also, it's also possible to have this filter, this spectrum chopping in logarithmic uh, discipline. So if you have a logarithmic discipline, logarithm for the zero frequency doesn't make sense. So that's why it starts from a very small amount here. And then it's logarithmic, logarithmically divided up to the high frequency, which is high. <laughs> if you do the subband coding without any kind of middle process, without any kind of middle process, so it means just analyzing the signal and then synthesizing the signal, what we meant by the subband coding in general was like this to have these filters, analysis filters, chopping down the spectrum into divisions, and then because we have M channels, we don't actually need all the information to, for example, if you have, if you, if you, if you here have uh, the length of the signal is N, if the length of the signal here is N, and you have M channels here. Can everybody see it? And we have M channels. It means that we actually need just n all over n of those samples for each of these hats, each of these channels, and not more than that. Otherwise, we have a redundancy and we don't need it. Because anyway, we just need the information for these, I mean, the, the, the part of the information which belongs to these frequencies bands or frequency parts of the spectrum. So it means that, for example, for the, the low pass frequency, for the low-pass frequency, we pass the signal through the low-pass filter and then we do the downsampling. And we know that, we remember from the downsampling, that downsampling means taking every n minus 1 samples and throw it away. So we have the signal, pass it through the filter, and then every n sample, n minus 1 sample, we throw it away. So we take every n sample. And the same thing for the other hats. And if you want to, without any kind of middle processing, you want just to recover the data, it means we need to have the upsampling. So we add zeros. We add zeros between any two samples. After doing that, we need to pass it through the filter. 
and already the, this is the decimation and this is the interpolation system. <coughs> you remember that? So the decimation system is actually placed here and that's exactly the interpolation system that's placed here. But unfortunately in subband coding stra strategy we need actually to have the decimation preceding the interpolation part. There's no other chance. We want to do the coding. That's why we need to actually economically use the information in the signal for different parts of the spectrum. So we need to have the decimation in the beginning and the interpolation coming afterwards. If it was the other way, we didn't have much problem. We know that there's no ADS. But in this way, possibly we have ADS. So we have ADS in band. That's one thing. We have also ADS between bands. Why? Is this either casing connectable? So we know that in the design of the filter, we always have a cutoff frequency and stuff, and so we have a transition there. We have a transition there. So it means that it's not possible to have such kind of filters adjacently connected to each other. We definitely have transition from one filter to another. If we have such kind of you know, such kind of adjacent filters, that means in part of the band which belongs to this transition from filter H0 to H1 or from H1 to H0, just a kind of ADS. These two ADS are unwanted, undesired. We need to design the entire st st structure of the filter bank in such a way that to minimize these two ADSs. That's fine. The second thing is... So actually I explained this, this structure. So in either case, it was without any kind of transition, and here we see that we need the transition. We don't have the chance. And if you say, someone says that, okay, we consider the guard band. If we consider the guard band, what happens? If you consider the bar band between any of these two and pass filters, what happens? The information loss. You will lose part of the information. And that part of the information might be necessary. If that part of the spectrum, that slice of the spectrum, for example, is located exactly on the performance or the pitch frequency information, it means that you've lost the spectrum, that part of the spectrum. So we cannot tolerate any kind of bar bands here. The strategy that we have to take for the design is to attenuate as much as possible the ADS. That's the only, the only thing we can do. That's the only chance that we, ha we have. Okay, maybe I can come back to this later. Let's start from a very simple example. If we just resort to the two-channel filter, simply two-channel filter. Let's start with this example, simple example of two-channel filter, and then we can generalize the idea for the n channels. That's the strategy that we normally engineers normally take. So, if we have just two channels. Based on the idea that I explained already, so we have a low-pass filter and probably a high-pass filter, complementary filters. So the low part of the spectrum, that part of the spectrum which belongs to the lower frequencies, should be passed through the first path, and the higher part of the spectrum should be passed through here. We do the down sampling because we just have two paths. So part of the data is not necessary for the first path and part for the second one. 
And if we do anything, if we do nothing in the video processing, I just want to recover. We want to, to know what happens. If the goal is just to recover the data, the output, so to get this X hat signal, we want to know what are the conditions to just tackle the problem of aliasing and probably if there is any, any other problem that might happen. So the goal is choosing the filters. What kind of filters? H0, G0, which is the complement. So analysis and the filter, the, the, the synthesis filters for the low frequency part and the high frequency part, H1 and G1. So we want to choose these filters in such a way that the output is just the delayed version of the input. Why? Why not just exactly the same thing? Why do we relax the condition here? to be the delayed version. Is it possible to have the perfect reconstruction of the output, so the reconstruction of the input and the output, without delay? Is that something that happens in nature, that we get something without pain? So it's not possible. But the system which is called all, the system which you want to implement it in the nature, inherently you should have a kind of payment. And the minimum payment that you have is just delay. And we know that delay is very good. It's the, it's, it's the, minimum, it's the minimum deterioration that we can tolerate. It because delay is just a phase shift. And that's okay. We can tolerate it. So that's why we say that for the relaxation of the constraint. It's just to have a delayed version of the input and the output. If we can have such a thing, we assume that this is a perfect reconstruction. From now on, anywhere in the articles that you see PR filter bank, it means perfect reconstruction filter bank. And PR filter bank means we want to have an output of the filter band after the synthesis, which is just the delayed version of the input with the minimal, minimal corruption of the signal. So, so in the Z domain, translating all, all I said, the Z domain means the X hat in the Z domain should be Z to the power of minus T of the input. And we know that this means the delay. Assuming that D samples for the delay is sufficient. So, the first question arises. Is perfect reconstruction possible using just one channel? Do we need to bother ourselves and to make several channels and design four filters? What happens if we just take one single line, one single path, and try to design that? So, here, let's give an example. If we can find a counterexample, sometimes proving something is just easy with having a counterexample. If we can bring up a counterexample, then we can get the idea. So, what do we mean by a single channel with a single path? It means that if we have this sub n, we pass it through a filter, then we reconstruct it using the filter, and we get something in the output, this half of n. That's the idea. Is it possible? So, perfect reconstruction in this case means that we need to design G such that G is H inverse. So that's an inverse system problem. An inverse system problem. We need to have G to be the inverse of H. A mathematical problem. So, 
Let's have an example. Assume that H is an FIR filter. You know that. What we desire is to have an FIR filter for, the, for this uh, subband code or any other structure because a FIR filter in implementation means a few number of tasks. IIR filter means infinite number of the tasks. It's almost difficult to implement an IIR filter without any kind of error. And secondly, a FIR filter will give us linear phase. So we want perfect reconstruction. It's better to have linear phase. If we distort the signal in the beginning with something which is unlinearly distorted, this nonlinear distortion will not, we will not be able to recover it in the second part. We are saying nonlinear distortion. If it's nonlinear distortion, it's really hard to catch it in the second part, to synthesize it again and reconstruct the signal, getting around with those nonlinearities we have already imposed in the beginning. So it's better to have a fire filter. A fire filter. Assume that we have a fire filter. This is in the frequency domain, in the time domain, assuming that we have a fire filter, for example, 2 over 3 and 1 over 3. Some of the examples I give here are from different references. I'll put the references in the website you can just take. From different professors in different places. Nathan comes from Washington University, a rich okay, from one of the UK universities, I don't know. And, uh, and Phil Schnitter from from one of the American universities. Um, so, 2 over 3 and 1 over 3. That's an FIR filter. 2 tap filter. Okay, what happens? It means that H of omega Can you see that? No problem? So, H of omega would be this is zero value, the DC value, and the first frequency with the coefficient of 1 over 3. So, which is almost low passive. <coughs> Take different values for the omega, and you will see that if you have, if you have data, you have, you have value for the low frequencies, but you don't have value from for the higher frequencies, better. therefore it, we can say that this filter is a low-pass filter. Okay. What is the inverse? The G is H inverse. The inverse would be 1 over this. And everybody knows that this filter is AIR. So, whatever FIR filter you use here, the inverse of the filter is AIR. So, you need an infinite number of the tabs. To recover the data. If you want. On the other hand, we know that the IR filter gives you nonlinear phase. That's only for the amplitude. So it means that recovering the information <coughs> from one channel data is not possible. So if, if you want to recover, for example, using P of N, we need infinite number of attacks, G0, G1, infinite. We have different other examples. For example, using the pitch of N to be 1 over 2 and 1 over 2, another FIR filter. And it, ha it happens, it might happen, that the signal x of n 
Look like this. Assuming that this is the signal given to the input. So, what is this signal? Every sample, we have a change. Every sample, one minus one, one minus one. So this signal in the digital domain means it has the highest frequency in this one. Because every sample is changing compared to the previous one. Okay? So it has the maximum frequency. So the frequency of this signal will be pi. And if you pass this signal through this low pass filter, what should be the result? What do you get here? What do you get here? You have a signal with a higher frequency, the highest possible frequency in the spectrum. And you pass it through this low pass filter. What will you get here? Nothing. Nothing. Zero. Signal is already killed. How do you want to recover? So using one channel is not possible. The entire idea we got is using one channel is not possible. Okay. We have to have multi-channel data. So, let's go through the structure we already took for uh, filter bank and sub -encoding. We are supposed to talk about these two channels. First of all, let's write down the equations that are associated with this filter bank. So, Assuming that we have x of n in the input and y of n in the output, then transferring everything to the z domain. That's the equation in the matrix norm or the, the vector norm that we can have. So for simplicity, let me just write down uh, simple equations here. So y0 of z, I'm just uh, distributing that equation into two, two individuals. So we will get the information much better here, I think. So y0 is the half of g0, h0 of xz, and h0 minus z x minus z. That's one part. And these, these are just based on the downsampling and how it's translated when you do in the z domain. So if you already have the equations for the upsampling and downsampling between the inputs and outputs. So what I'm trying to write down here is just translating everything in the final stage, after applying those upsampling and downsamplings, okay? Y one, just the same way, would be H one zero, H one Z, X Z, and H one minus Z. So, and we know that the final y of n, which in the z domain is y of z, is just the sum over this two values, y0 plus y1. If we write it down in the simple form, and let me factor out these z indications. So, G0, H0, G1, H1, X, so plus G0, 
g0 h0 minus z I need to put it here because the sign is changing and g1 h1 minus it's minus okay Just look at these two terms, the first term and the second term. This is y of z, this is x of z, so plus x minus z. We want perfect reconstruction. What should be the constraint? When we say perfect reconstruction means The perfect reconstruction based on the previous slide means output is delayed version of the input plus nothing plus nothing else. Output should be delayed version of input plus nothing. So it means this this part. So I just take it from here. This should be equal to, or just simplifying, yeah, that's just equal to z to the power of minus l. So the entire part, the entire coefficient here, from 1 over 2 to the end, can be such a thing. And this part should be. These are the conditions for perfect reconstruction filter. This term, this term with the coefficient that should be equal to this delay version, is due to the distortion so if you if you want to to have no distortion we mean that this should be equal to this delay without distortion so this is the condition for no distortion the condition for no distortion and this part comes from the aliasing of x z and x minus z so if you want no aliasing this is the condition. That's the no aliasing condition. So the constraints that come after the equations, the simple equations, for no aliasing and no distortion are mentioned here. For more information, you can refer to the Phil Schneider. I will put it in um, the website. The L is the delay. Delay. Yeah. So delay translated in the z domain will be z to the power of minus L. Mm -hmm. Minus whatever means that much sample delay. So the output will have L samples delay with respect to the input. And that's based on the I think it should be zero. That's the constraint for having a perfect reconstruction filter back for two channels. But you can generalize the idea to even more. <clears throat> now, so, before going to, to the next slide, which tries to introduce one of the most important filter banks that practically in many cases, people are using this, which is called orthogonal perfect reconstruction FIR filter bank. So filters are FIR. The strategy is to have the perfect reconstruction, and filters are orthogonal with respect to each other. They are all concatenated in one statement, 
in one phrase actually, orthogonal, perfectly construction, if I up into that. So, together with those constraints, and if you want to design those filters, because now we have four filters, we have to design them. H0, and the synthesis part, counterpart, which is G0, H1, and G1. We have to design these four filters based on those constraints to get a perfect reconstruction with this kind of this kind of presumptions. So for this orthogonal perfect reconstruction, first of all we have FIR and we need linear phase. During the FIR filter lecture, we said that to get FIR filter with linear phase, we have some conditions which was the symmetricity of the structure in the FIR filter around the middle tab. Remember that? We had four types of FIR filters in auxiliary, one of the auxiliary videos that I uh, put in the website. We talked about different types, type 1, 2, 3, and 4, but there are some preconditions for all the linear phase FIR filters, and one of them is the symmetricity around the middle tab. So, if you want to design those filters, to get the linear phase, we shouldn't forget about that structure. We know already from FIR filters. So, so we need a real coefficient FIR filter. A real coefficient FIR filter with even length n. So the length of the filter should be even if you want to get perfect reconstruction, FIR filter, which is orthogonal and all of these conditions. First of all, we have the length n, which is even. So n should be 2 or any number times 2. 2 to the power of whatever. So, Applying all, the, all of these assumptions will give you h0, h0 is the minus 1, and this condition to be equal to 1, and this condition for h1. And getting from this to g0 and g1. And the orthogonality pre-assumption for this filter band implies that h0 should be power symmetry, and the power symmetry speed is this. Means that the low pass part of the power and the high pass part of the power should be orthogonal. If it should be orthogonal, we see that they are orthogonal. This figure always represents the orthogonality. These two curves are orthogonal. Or, for the power case, it's a power symmetry. And H0, H1, power complementary. So the power of H0 and the power of H1 are, looks like this, and they are orthogonal with respect to the mid frequency, which is pi by 2. That's the structure you have to take. This is the degree of freedom. You have four filters, and you can, you, can, you can have any kind of selection for those filters. That respects the, the, the assumption and the constraint that you have with, with the construction. And you can choose in this way. If you choose the filters in this way, what you get in the output is as I mentioned here. Perfect reconstruction. But beforehand, let me give a simple example of the numbers so that you'll get the intuition much easier, I think. So, look at those conditions. No aliasing, no distortion, and those filters. From here, the first part, from here, let's choose something. For example, if we choose G0 to be equal to H1, G0 to be equal to H1, H1 minus Z. And G1 to be equal to minus H0 minus 
That's a kind of selection. If you choose the relation between, the, between these four filters to look like this, if you put it here, you see that these conditions can, can hold. So, by choosing like this, the conditions are respected. Now, assume that we choose a replacement for G0, H0. So G0, Z, H0, Z, assume that we, we put it as this replacement. And then choose this replacement instead of those two equations. What we get is We know that G0 is the first path, so it's low-pass filter. H0 is in the first path, so it's low-pass filter. Two low-pass filters times each other will give you a low-pass filter. So C0 is a low-pass filter. If you can design C0, a low-pass filter that respects this <coughs> equation, then, and if you can factorize it into two different low-pass filters, in any way, you can get different types of filters. Now I'm trying to do that. This C0 actually, it, it has a name. It's called half-band filter. In the design, they call it half-band filter. So, And you might know that what way it's called half band filter. Very simple. Just just put the example, for example, C C0 Z. Put it A0 plus B or A plus B C minus 1, C C minus 2, D Z minus 3, and E Z minus 4. Then C0 minus z becomes okay and now this minus this the first part the second part the third part the fourth part so you see that half of the coefficients are not necessary to think about it <coughs> and I take the structure to be perfectly constructed half of the things that we get for the filter C of Z which is a low pass filter, half of the coefficients are ignored in the, in the final structure. <coughs> we get zero for half of these. Half of the coefficients, the coefficients are involved and the half we can ignore. They have no constraint. That's why it's called half band filter. So, If you have an example that so let me example with numbers This example as a number, for example, that C0 is, for example, 1 plus z minus 1 to the power of 4 and 1 minus 1 plus 4 z minus 1 minus z to the power of minus 2. 
This is a low pass filter. If we give it to the filter to the MATLAB, you will find that the result is a low pass filter. Assume that you solve everything and finally you got this kind of equation. The important part is the next thing. So if you get such kind of you just choose such such kind of uh, low pass filter, which is on the other hand factorized into two factors, G and Z. You can choose different G and Z structure, and based on those different structures, you can you can get different types of the filters or the feedbacks. For example, you you see that let let's have G zero here and H zero here. As an example, you can have one here and the rest of the stuff here. That's one option. You can have one plus z minus one, the power of two here, and the rest of the stuff, which is one minus, so the power of two, together with the second part here. Or any other different types, for example, this is a combination of two poles, so you can two different factors, so you can factorize it into into this. And the positive side of that. So just let's see, because it's very important. So, just let's say one statement about this and then go to the next slide. These are all, so the, the, this, this term times this term, in all these cases will give you the, the same C of Z. In all the cases. But you're choosing different G0 and H0 values as a designer. But let's see what happens. For example, if you choose this structure, if you choose this structure, so this structure gives you the linear phase. Linear phase, FIR filters. You can just hold it with this one. If you choose this one, It's not a linear phase you get, but they are orthogonal. So you find the orthogonality condition is already held, but you will not get a linear phase. You know that we have the FIR filters. And for the FIR filters, based on the tabs and the structure of the tabs, the symmetricity, how they are spread around the middle tab, the number of the tabs and so on, you will get different types of FIR structures. So if you choose this part, this structure, you will not get linear phase. Why? Because the condition of the linear FIR filter is not hold by this structure, by this choosing, and by choosing this structure. If you take this one, you have the linear phase, but you don't have the orthogonal structure. So you need to actually factorize that C of Z into two different G and H in such a way that you get that you know, perfect reconstruction. For example, if you, if you want the orthogonal perfect reconstruction linear phase the final filter, you have to choose H and G like this. And there are different other types. So we have quadrature mirror filter bank. Stop. Okay. And different, different other types. So, Let's have a 